So it's a famous story recorded in Tractate Hagiga, and it reads like this. And I want you to listen carefully to the story because because some of the detail is is all of the detail is critical in understanding what happened. And what I'm sharing with you is. Um, kind of uh, based on based on the mimer that we are learning in MTC in the morning these these past weeks which we just concluded so here's the story get with me a second I just want to get the Gemara pretty short stuff you got it on the base Yep, it is. Sorry, get that in a minute. Okay. Our sages taught. There were four who entered into the orchard. That's how the Gemara phrases it. Pardis. Many opinions as to what this means, but all concur, it means a deeply mystical experience. Hasidus explains, actually Rashi says so too, at a very basic level, they ascended to heaven. They ascended into the heavenly realms who were the four? And this is what happened. Ben Azai and Ben Zoima. Acher and Rabbi Akiva. Who are these? So Ben Azai and Ben Zoma, it's a strange name, the son of Azai and the son of Zoma. Why not say their first names? Actually, their, their first names were both Shimon. Shimon ben Azza and Shimon ben Zoma, because they died young and never received smicha, they referred to, are referred to as the son of their respective fathers. Other reasons as well, but they were two. Acher, what is, who is Acher? Acher means literally other, somebody else. What a strange name for a sage. Well, actually it wasn't his name. His name was Elisha ben Avuha. But because, as you will hear, became an apostate, he's referred to by our sages throughout the Talmud as Acher, the other one. And the fourth, Rabbi Akiva. Before I tell you what Rabbi Akiva said to them before they entered, which is really going to be the crux of our discussion, let me tell you what happened to each of them respectively. The Gemara relates, Ben Azai glanced and died. His soul expired in the very experience, in his transcendent experience. Ben Zoyma, he looked, he glanced, Ben Nifka, and became insane. Acher, Alisha ben Avua, the Talmud, the Gemara describes his response, chopped down the saplings in the orchard. The metaphor here, the pardis, the heavenly realm, the translation of what pardis actually is, is orchard. It's also an allusion to the four levels of the Torah, Pshat, Remes, Drush, and Sod. They entered into subsequent deeper and deeper levels to even not to even, but arriving at the mystical level. And there, in this mystical experience, as a result of it, Acher chops the saplings. He becomes an apostate. And Rabbi Akiva, Nichnes B'Sholem, V'yotze B'Sholem, entered in peace and emerged in peace. Whole, 
complete, unscathed. So the question raised in the Maimed is, a number of questions. And again, I'll get to in a moment what Rabbi Kiva said to them, to his colleagues before they entered. But the question is, the Gemara just said that Rabbi Kiva entered in peace and emerged in peace. Well, they all entered in peace. The problem was the aftermath. So why does it say only Rabbi Akiva nichnas b'sholem v'yotze b'sholem? Surely it should be that they all entered equally and only he emerged in peace or whole. Sholem means whole, unscathed, unaffected, detrimentally, no detrimental effect. Why does the Gemara speak of the way he entered as being distinct from the others? To understand that, I'm going to share with you the words that he said before they began this mystical journey. He said to them as a warning, when you reach near the pure marble stones, in Hebrew, do not say, Al Toimru, do not say, Mayim, Mayim. There is water here. There is water here. That's what he said to them. What does this mean? So, the simple meaning, as explained by Rashi, he writes a basic commentary on the, on the Talmud. They're looking at, this is all metaphoric and spiritual, but they're looking at the walls of heaven. I'll read the commentary. It seems as if there are 100,000 myriads of waves of water. In reality, there's not even one drop, only the pristine clarity of the pure marble stones. So don't, he's telling them, don't confuse what you're seeing and don't say it's water, water. And Rashi adds, and therefore conclude we can't proceed further because of this wall of water. Don't say that. Very cryptic, very strange. What is meant by these pure marble stones that appear like Water, don't say that it's water. So the answer, friends, is as follows. First, I want to tell you another little story. You've all heard of Herod, who was a tyrant, actually, and murdered the sages in a fit of rage. Almost all of them leaving only one to survive, Baba ben Buta. Later, he, his story was that he was a Roman vassal, he was a convert, a slave, um, bore a great ship on his shoulders. The sages were critical of him and he had them cruelly executed. Later, he regretted his actions and he asked Boba ben Buta, what should he do to uh, atone, to achieve atonement? Or... So he told him that you extinguish the light of the world, the sages, almost all of them, rebuild the light of the world. The temple had fallen into, into disrepair. And so the end permission from Rome was, Rome was, was uh, tacitly achieved. And he rebuilt the temple, and we all know that the Talmud says he, would, he who did not see the base of Migdash rebuilt by Herod Hurdus in Hebrew never saw a beautiful building edifice in his life. Here's an interesting part of the whole story. So he made he made the the, the stones of marble, and their color was white with blue and green natural streaks in the marble. He wanted to cover them. He wanted to overlay the stones of the Besamikdash in gold, in gold. And the sages told him not to. 
And he said, because it looks like Idvis at the Yoma, waves of the ocean, so leave it. This appearance is appropriate, don't cover them in gold. Again, imagery of water, and these are the walls of the Beis Amikdash. So it's all very mystical. And I'm going to attempt with God's help to try and explain this all to you. And I hope you understand, and please comment, question, as, I, um, as I'm speaking, so that, so that we're all clear, that you understand what I'm trying to convey. Here we go. I'm going to take you friends on this very same journey. We're going to enter, ascend heavenward. How do I know what's there? Chassidus reveals, Kabbalah reveals. So you all may have heard of the great symptom. Let me explain. The process of creation described in the classic Kabbalah works, notably by the Arizal and in the work Eitzach is as follows. God manifests initially this great infinite light. It's infinite. Creation cannot exist in that domain, in that reality, for creation would be utterly nullified, dissolved out of existence, overwhelmed entirely by God's infinite and absolute presence or revelation. So that Arizal speaks about the great symptom, this great contraction or screening of the light the language he uses is deceptively simple and therefore has lent itself to misinterpretation by well-intended students of the Kabbalah, very famous ones, great Talmudic scholars, in fact. This is not our subject to understand the nature of this tzimtzum, which means contraction or screening or veiling of the infinite light, although that's what we're talking about today. Um, but this is a huge subject. That there are volumes in Hasidus that deal with it, entire volumes. If you would gather all of the discourses that deal with the Tzimtzum, it would, it would make up volumes. The result is of this great screening or veiling of the infinite light. The result is that post Tzimtzum, God manifests descriptive, finite manifestations, attributes. You're all familiar with the 10 spheres, the 10 divine attributes. They have name and description. Moreover, the human being, all of us, our psychological, our physiological, and psychological and spiritual makeup is a reflection of these 10 attributes. So we speak now of, of 10 defined manifestations. In a word, God is now manifesting, manifesting himself in a descriptive, finite, limited way. The 10 attributes. That's all as a result of the filtering out, if you like, or the eclipse or the screening of the original infinite light. Simple way to, um, simple imagery to give us some measure of understanding is pure light that is projected through a film that is images and colors. Film, the old celluloid film. So the light that then projects post through the film on the screen is descriptive and colors and very defined shapes and so on. What has caused the light now to manifest 
with these colors and descriptions and form and shape, the image, imagery, the film on the screen, the image on the screen is the film that has profoundly compromised the otherwise pure infinite light that projects from the source pre-film in a boundless infinite way. I'm just, my son is calling repeatedly, he's like, hello. Yes, I'm in love with Shir, actually. No, I need it. I need it. Sorry. Okay, bye. You kind of clear? So this is the idea of the Tzimtzum is that it compromises the infinite light. The light now projects post Tzimtzum as a result of the screen or the film in the imagery that we just used. It is now descriptive and has colors and shapes and so on. You're also familiar that there are four worlds. All these worlds exist post Tzimtzum. The highest world is the world of Atsilis. And then what happens is that there are further veils and screens and films that further filter limit the brilliance, the intensity of the light, creating more and more finite and descriptive hardcore manifestations. So the 10 spheres, the 10 attributes, project downwards on four planes with greater and greater limitation. At the bottom of this ladder of divinity called Seydrish Dalshalus, the very bottom is the cosmos, the universe, which God creates at the bottom of this divine energy in its progression downwards. And it's the very minutest investure of divine energy that animates and sustains and governs our world. I realize as I'm speaking, I'm raising a whole um, the word specter of questions, but such is the nature of this, of this subject matter that any piece of information immediately engenders questions and but what about and, I realize that, but we're just gonna to have to try and just focus on, on our discussion. So I apologize. So let's begin our journey then, having expressed this broad outline this, of the ladder of divinity that stretches as it were metaphorically from God to our world, to our universe. So as we ascend friends, as we ascend the lowest world, the 10 attributes, highly descriptive, highly relatable on a human plane, reflective of our own makeup. The higher we go, the more intense, the more brilliant become these lights and their separation dissolves somewhat as they merge and coalesce into ever greater unity, the higher we go. But, all levels up to the original Tzimtzum, that first veil, that first screen, that first film, this color, this description to one degree or another. It's just the higher we go, the less defined, the more ethereal, the more unified, the more abstract. The more abstract the lights, the more abstract the manifestations. But there is still, as in art, some form. It's more suggestive, more subtle, the higher we go, the lower down the ladder, and it's called a ladder, the more definitive, the more tangible, the more descriptive, the higher we go, these attributes assume ever greater, more ethereal, less tangible form. But nonetheless, the fourth world, the world of Atsilis, which corresponds to these four letters of Hashem's name, there too, its description, there is color of sorts, there's description of sorts, and I mean this all, of course, metaphorically, not physically. So now, as we've ascended, we've ascended through the four worlds, I should tell you that um, the truth is, davening has four stages, and the Amida is the ultimate stage of prayer. That's the world of Atsilus, of 
oneness and unity with Hashem. To be sure, the world of Atzillus is still a world. There are 10 attributes there, which again, find parallel within our own souls. But the attributes there are sublime and unified and rarefied. It's called the world of purity. We make reference to the world of Atzillus countless times in prayer. The first time we do is the first thing in the morning after the Maidan, even we describe the soul's descent. We say the soul you have granted me is pure. That's the world of Atzillus. Then we say you created the world of Bria. You formed it, the world of Yitzira. You have, you have blown it into me and you preserve it. That's the world of Asiya. We actually describe the soul's descent through these worlds every morning. And repeated references to these worlds throughout prayer. And as is mentioned, the Amida is the state where one enters into this sublime oneness, silence. The Amida is silent because the moment of unity is silent. The clamor, the clamor is over. That's the world of Bria, the yearning, the fire, even the passionate fire. But Atzillus, all is silent in absolute dissolved oneness. But still, even in Atzillus, God's manifestation is still has some kind of sublime description. There are 10 attributes manifested in the world of Atzillus. It's all post since. In general, Shabbos is the world of Atzillus. We enter in the world of Atzillus and Shabbos. Ever deeper as Shabbos progresses. Would you then now come with me deeper still as we penetrate the Tzimtzum itself? The very veil, the very screen, the very film. So what you heard me say till now, till now, what you would expect to experience is the infinite light beyond all description, an entirely different reality. As sublime as Atzillus is, end of the day, it's finite and has its parallel in our own experience. The ten attributes of God's intellect, God's emotion, these are highly descriptive, even in the world of Atzillus sublime as they are. But now as we go beyond the Timson into the realm of the infinite, all worlds, all words and worlds cease to exist. And it's the absolute exclusive, infinite, boundless revelation of God himself. And that's what we would expect to find. But dear friends, Let's probe deeper still. And no doubt, you will be as shocked as the four entered into the, into the Pardis, but as we'll see, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. To understand what I'm talking about now, as we now ascend into the world of absolute, boundless, beyond light, light. I want to share with you the following. There is a verse in the book of Proverbs that reads as follows. Kamayim ponim al ponim, kain leiv ha'odam la'adam, which means kamayim ponim al ponim, like the image that is reflected in the water. If you stand before the water, your image is reflected in the water. Is is present in the water. The water reflects back, in other words, the image that you present before it. So too, says the verse, 
is the heart of one man to another. Simple meaning, and this is profound in its own right, is that the way you project yourself to another person's heart, the way you, you touch them is the way they inevitably will touch you. This itself is a very um, profound and challenging statement. At the end of the day, if I love altruistically, then the one to whom I'm showing this love cannot help but love me back the same way. I say it's challenging because in relationships, it often appears that it's not so. It's only one way and there's no love in return. With the emesis, it's not possible. It's not possible. The human heart must respond, must respond to true love in the same way that the water must and does natu naturally reflect the face that's placed before it. And if my love doesn't elicit your love in response, it's because I never really touched you. I wasn't loving you, I was loving me and just absorbed you within me. Or in other words, a love that is, I love the way you make me feel is no love. I'm still left with me. Love is self-transcendence and connecting to the other for who that person is and on their terms. And so it's simply not possible to be the recipient of such selflessness, which means to have been touched and not respond. If you are touched and moved, you will respond. But what touches me is only when you go beyond you, then you touch me. So King Solomon, the wisest of all, tells us that the water reflects the face that's placed before it. So too does the human heart reflect the love that comes to it from another. That's the simple meaning of the verse. And as I'm sure you might agree, it's profound and challenges us, challenges us. easy to cast, much easier to cast the blame on the other in a failed relationship. But ultimately it's up to me. And now we're going to go much deeper, friends. It's all related, but much deeper. The water before whom the face stands. The water, friends, pure and translucent. Water has no image or form per se or color. The water represents the pure divine. The infinite light of Hashem before the tints and before veil, before screened. Moreover, the verse spoke, the, ver the verse spoke about the heart of one person responding to the heart of another. Cain lev ha'adam el ha'adam. In Kabbalah, friends, the Kabbalah speaks about the earthly Adam and the heavenly Adam. The earthly Adam, earthly man is us. The heavenly Adam is Hashem. So here, here's friends, as we probe and descend deeper into the audience of the infinite light, the metaphor now is the pure water 
but we're going to encounter friends. And I'm gonna say the words now, please bear with me as I try to explain this. Probing to the very essence of Hashem. There we're going to encounter our own image. Our own image. In the very infinite, translucent, pure, in the words of Kabbalah and Hasidus, the pshitus, the simplicity in the most virtuous sense, simple, divested of all form and description and appellation and boundary and limit, there, you and I, each one of us, our image is there in those divine waters. Bear with me now as you try and understand this a little bit. You see, friends, the infinite light that God projects, that's not a given. It's not a given. As soon as we say the word light and revelation and projection, we've already acknowledged some aspect of otherness revealed exactly where the essence of Hashem is beyond infinite light. Words fail here and nothing is said at all. So when the Kabbalah speaks of the Ur in Tzav, the infinite light of God, that is already, already a consequence of Hashem's decision a decision, a free choice, free of all values and considerations because there are none for him. He's created them all. He chose because he chose. It's all we can say. It's all part of that choice to have a purpose. Hear these words. A choice, he chooses to have a purpose to create. He chooses to have a, an agenda. He chooses to have a desire. In other words, friends, Hashem is not to define God as the creator. God is a creator. Fall short. He's not a creator. A creator has to create. And a creator assumes that there is space and place in which to produce my, my art, my creation. God chose to be a creator. He descended on the plane to be a creator by choice. He utterly transcends the whole notion of creator. He is because he chose to be, but he utterly transcends it. So to be a creator, that very first step is this whole notion of otherness, the notion about no actual otherness, just the notion of otherness. And that's what infinite light means. Infinite light means God's choice to give rise to the possibility, the notion of something other than him. And at the end of that process, as we described earlier, Hasidus devotes in Kabbalah thousands and thousands of discourses, this whole elaborate chain of worlds and the tzimtzum of the worlds and levels and levels and levels. They are all the divine light being screened and, and limited and compromised and described in this descending projection of the divine, again, the bottom of which is the cosmos, the universe. What is his chosen desire? It's, we need to understand something now too, I'm sorry. Why did God create? Why did God create? Answer is, there's no reason. In the sense, there is no reason. Because if there's a reason, then the reason compelled him to create, then he's limited. Then worship the reason and forget him, whoever you think he is. There's no why. It's like asking, why does God exist? There's no reason. If there's a reason, then worship the, the reason for his existence, which justifies it. Chas v'shalom. 
Hashem is. That's it. There's nothing more we can say. There's no reason why he is. Because he is. So too, why did God choose to create? Can't be a reason. That means the reason compelled him. And the reason, the, that means the reason is he chose to. He chose to create. The valid question is not why did you choose? It's what did you choose? Okay. So he created. What do you want? What do you want? What's the objective? That's a valid question. Why do you need the objective? There's no explanation for that. Why do you need this? He chose. He chose to have a need. He chose to have a need. Chose to have a purpose. Why do you need a need and a purpose? Utterly no reason. But the fact is he did. Here we are. And here's the Torah to explain it. So what's the purpose? So the whole purpose of creation of everything is because he wants a relationship with you and me. That's the whole purpose. And that's the meaning of, that's the meaning in these pristine waters, symbolic of that first infinite revelation, the whole beginning of the process of creation, what's present, our image. Our image is there. That is what he conjures. He conjures the pleasure he's going to have, chosen pleasure, because he chooses to, and chooses to have this thing called pleasure from our relationship with him and our struggles and triumphs and successes and failures and tshuva. That's the whole purpose. The purpose is a relationship with us in the minutia of our lives here in the physical world. And that's the image. That's the image that is there in the divine mind and desire at the most, the most sublime and first stage of creation, which is the emergence, the chosen emergence of the infinite light or the supernal divine waters. Our image is there. Now, I want to share with you a little more nuance here. <laughs> Friends, the image in the water, looking at the water, is that something separate from the water? Is it even a creation from the water? No. But it's there. It's there, the image, as you face the water in every detail of your face, of your persona is there reflected in the pure, still water. The paradox is the image is there, but it's not separate from the water. Because we speak here of God's infinite light, that first revelation, that first stage of creation. You and I only emerge at the very end of this whole process in the physical world, born to human parents way later in time and in level. But our image is there which means his desire of us is there. Inseparate from, inseparable from him. It's only the infinite light, but in the infinite light, paradoxically, reflected there in all of our detail and, and limitation is you and I. The Maimah probes deeper, but the soul, the soul is bound up with the very essence of God, even higher than in the infinite light. And that's what God is conjuring the Yisrael, Olub Mahshava, the thought of us ascends in the divine thought and mind, the infinite light or the metaphor of the water. To summarize up what I'm saying right now, just to distill it, what I'm saying is that what motivates God, it's a chosen motivation, but what motivates the entire process of the infinite light and the seven heavens and the four worlds and they say it's all one thing and nothing else at the end of the day we invite him into our lives it's the relationship with us that he wants he wants to be one with us in our physical lives here in this world in the minutia of our lives not just the grand moments but the small details of our lives like any relationship therefore is expressed in the casual encounter, not the big prepared or contrived moments. They don't define the relationship. It's the casual unprepared moments.
that expresses the depth of who these two people are in their relationship. And so too with God, he wants a relationship with, with us that will permeate every aspect of who we are. That's how much he loves us and that's how much we are integral to him because, integral to him because our image is there in the pristine revelations of the highest level. That's what's there. That's what begins the whole process. I hope it's somewhat clear. So let's go back to the story and understand what happened to the four sages and, and in contrast to Rabbi Akiva, who not just emerged in peace, but entered in peace. What did he say to them? He said to his colleagues, when we enter the heavenly realms and you'll encounter the Avne Shayish Tori, the stones of pure water. Don't say, Mayim, Mayim, there's water, there's water. Explains the Arizal and Hasidus. There's not two waters, he's telling them, but one. This, the walls are the tzimtzum. That's the screen, the film that separates externally the infinite revelation from the finite revelation. Description, worlds, angels, you and I at the bottom of this rung, this ladder of divinity, all separated by the great divide, the great primal tzimtzum, the tzimtzum addition. That's the wall he speaks of. That's the walls of the temple. It heard this, that here it wanted a couple with gold and the sages said not. Leave them with the imagery of water, even the tzimtzum. Now listen carefully. Do not say, said Rabbi Akiva to his colleagues, there is water and there is water. Meaning, do not think that the tzimtzum therefore divides between two realities, the divine reality and the created reality. The infinite and the finite. But rather, it's all one. Meaning, our limitations, our finitude, our humanity is there in the most pristine, deepest level of the divine revelation. They did not see it. They did not probe deeper. And I'll tell you why. They were unable to. Only Rabbi Akiva touched the infinite so deeply that he could see his own image and the image of every other. They did not see that image. They saw only the infinite. And because they saw the infinite, so for Benazai, the longing and the yearning to unite with the infinite, he simply left the body behind, like the children of Aaron, not of an Aviv. Ben Zoma, mad. He becomes mad because compelled to come back to the world, but now that he's touched transcendence, how can he possibly live here? He is a, a, an absolute, not just discontent, but restlessness and inability to, re to reconcile that he has to live here locked in a body in a physical world where he had touched the transcendent and the infinite. And so he, he, he becomes mad, insane. He simply is not able to reconcile and he res resists with every moment the fact that he's tethered to this body in the world when he had touched the pure waters the higher waters for him, there's two realities, the, the colored, defined, limited water, that's our world, but there's the transcendent water, the infinite, the pure light. And Acher, his response, he becomes an apostate. There are many levels to Acher's deep error but the most basic one is an apostate is a denial of the oneness of God. So there's two realities. There's the divine and there's our reality. And the symptom has created two realities, a plurality. God's revealed there, concealed here. So what's the point of it all? Let's focus on Rabbi Akiva. 
Rabbi Akiva enters in peace, the others didn't. Here's the crux of the matter. Because their entrance into the paradise was their own personal longing. I want to know the truth. There is a song. <laughs> There's a song, I want to know what love is. Apparently it's a famous song. As a yeshiva student, it was blasting in the streets. We all heard the song. I want you to show me whoever the, the band is. I'm sure you're familiar, some of you at least. This is a quest for love because I want to experience love. And I want you to show me. So you're incidental. I want you to show me. I don't need you anymore. I want your love. So I want you. That's a selfish love. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. Because they entered into the pardus. They entered into the pardus with the selfish agenda for I want, to, I want to know and experience truth and transcendence and love. Therefore, in these three diverse ways, they did not exit in peace. Rabbi Akiva enters in peace means, why is he entering into this deep communion with God? Not because of his agenda, not because I want to know you, but because you want to know me. You want me, says God, to touch you. This is what you want. Therefore, entering into the most sublime levels of heaven, he penetrates to the very depth and sees this truth. What God wants is a relationship with us here in this world. And therefore, leaves the paradise imbued with this truth. There's no two waters, says Rabbi Yekiba to his colleague before they enter. There's no two realities. Infinite and the finite and the unreconcilable worlds, realities, they're incompatible, infinite and finite. For in the depth of the infinite lies our very finite presence. For that is his desire. And that's why he revealed his infinite revelation. Only in order, in the end, to give rise to this world and you and I in a relationship. And that's what he discovers there. So it's one water, it's one truth. There's no plurality. Heaven, earth, infinite, finite, revealed, present, eclipsed, not present. For we are present. Our limited humanity, the image, our image is there in the divine, pristine, infinite waters. It's one truth. The infinite and the finite, one, there. God's revelation and our presence. Now to understand what I'm saying, friends, I you know, maybe presumptuous of me to try and even, the, we need to learn a lot of Hasidus and really toil, toil to understand and, and learn much and learn and learn and learn. But I do hope, I do hope that we have some sense, you've got some sense of what I'm trying to convey of this so exquisite and beautiful mimer. So they failed again because they were looking for something. Akiva wasn't looking, I'll be Akiva for anything. Maybe Akiva's ascent is because God wants him to know the truth, his truth. They were kind of blinded by the light and could not see that in the light was their own image. And Rabbi Akiva could see his image, their image, all of us, there in the infinite light, for that's why there's an infinite light. As we said earlier, this Hashem is beyond his infinite light. Why did he project this? It's all for one purpose, all of creation, everything, the angels. Because he conjured and entertained, as it were, in the divine being, the relationship he's going to have with us. That's all he wants. That's the motivation of it all. That's his chosen desire.
right? So do not say, so Rabbi, give it to his colleagues. There is Mayim and there is Mayim. There is compromised revelation. And there is the infant revelation and the two, the two realities separated by the great divide, the, the pure marble stone, the Tzimtzum. There's no two realities. It's all one, all one at the most sublime and origins of it all, of everything. In the words of our sages, our sages put it this way, before God created, he consulted. It's hinted to in scripture, let us make man. Who is he talking to? This is in Bereshis, let us make man. Hashem consulted with you and I. That's what it means. Nimlach same shal tzaddikim. Every Jew consulted means that means it's consulted. It means that this relationship that he knows chose to have with you and I in this world. That's what starts the whole process of creation. Seven heavens, the angels. On Yom Kippur, we spend most of Yom Kippur Rosh Hashanah, you know, in these incredible poetry describing the heavenly worlds. Friends, it's all all of it only there to serve and, and be part of this process, this evolutionary process, this process that in the end results in the world as we know it, and you and I and our struggles, and that, that's, that's all it is. It's all Hashem wants. To rephrase it, and I'll let you go. I wish this God. that you would appreciate, and, and we can, because Hasidus has revealed this, how much I want you. With all of my divine being, there's nothing else that I want. Just to be part of your life. And I wish that you would want me in that same way that I want you. Rabbi Akiva enters, enters this whole journey with that, with that desire, with that love. A love for you. Okay, my friends. Thanks for joining. I hope, I hope that we were successful in some measure. Sure you were. Because it's the truth, and the truth resonates. So I'm sure you, everybody got something or a lot, I hope. From this, from our discussion today. Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah, yeah and I think I told you it's from the Maimer, 1962. Yudal Lefnis in 1962. Rebbe turned 60, and it was the first time he made a Fabreng in connection with his birthday. It was a big... Big surprise for everyone, most people didn't even know when his birthday was. And it was extraordinary for He said, to my modern and many talks, much of them published and were edited by him later over the years. And it's, I'm just sharing it with Lily, just, uh, just so beautiful. So have a, have a wonderful week. Thank Hope you. Hope to see you all soon. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Rabbi, you, can I ask a question? Thank you. All the best. You can ask a question, sure. I'm just, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of wow uh, in in this in this class that you that you gave today, and thank you for it. Uh, I was wondering, came to my mind that the soul really has a very hard time coming into this world. It's it's. Um, it's through the Tim Tum, it's probably very painful for it. Uh, yet the desire to live is very strong. And I was, it's interesting to notice the conflict within these two um, 
within, within these two facts, I would say. That's the tension. That, that's exactly the tension we speak of. In the words of the Kabbalah, actually it's not Kabbalah, it's in scripture, Ratsui Vishuv, transcendence and imminence. Presentness and transcendence. And the end of the day, it's not two different movements, but it's one. It's really one truth. All life works this way. The heart expands and contracts. The lungs expand and contract. Take in, exhale. It's all a reflection of this constant tension. And the resolution of which we're in the essence lies. And that's the deeper meaning of Hashem Hu Kim. And the simple meaning is like, what does Hashem Likim mean? God is God. Yudke Vovke is the infinite. Pre-tim tzum, Likim is post-tim tzum. Who? It's all him. It's all one. Thank you. Yeah. We need to learn more. You know, it's a very sublime ethereal ideas, of course, as you're appreciating. The more we learn, the more we learn, the more we can internalize and truly live live this truth which is the truth right behind everything everything right and it's 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 really the struggle and, and the yearning of all of existence is is this truth is to connect and express this truth okay friends thank you Thank you for joining again. Thank you, Rachel. Elite everybody. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.